All right, welcome, folks. Um, I'm John. I'm the VP of Engineering at Canonical, who look, up, look after Juju and our kind of charm engineering teams. So I did a talk earlier on today about kind of an intro to Juju and model-driven operations and kind of what we're trying to achieve with this whole gig. Um, the idea of this session is to give a bit of an overview of kind of how charms have evolved over time, specifically for people that are here who are thinking about getting started with charms because they can't get enough of what they've seen while they've been here, kind of some of the uh, various different frameworks that have happened. So as you see terminology, you understand it. Um, a little bit about the work we've done with Kubernetes and kind of how that support has evolved and also the, the, what I think is very exciting work that's coming up in the next kind of 18 to 24 months. So one of the first things I think that trips people up a little bit when they get started is um, Judy has been around for quite a long time. It was initially kicked off in 2009. Um, and so over that time, there has been quite a few different ways to kind of author charms, write charms, different frameworks, different, you know, kind of packaging techniques. Um, and so I wanted to call those out a little bit. And there's a bit more detail at the link at the bottom of the slide, but also to kind of call out that essentially anything left of operator framework, if you're starting from scratch, kind of ignore, move on, <laughs> like nothing to see here, right? So uh, we started out in 2009. There was no real framework from Canonical to build charms. We, Juju provides hook tools that you can execute in a unit, and so often charms were just bash scripts essentially in a, in a directory. Um, the services framework was the kind of first attempt at using Python to do that and kind of interact with those hook tools um, and kind of started with a library called Charm Helpers. We then kind of moved forward into the reactive framework, which was a kind of play on reactive programming. Um, and that also made heavy use of the kind of charm helper stuff. And if anyone takes a look at our kind of OpenStack offerings or our charmed Kubernetes offerings, a lot of the charms there are still using this tech because they've kind of been dragging along for a few years. And, but all of the later stuff they're writing will start engineering, be re-engineered essentially an operator framework. So um, I think this is kind of an interesting point. So operator framework is the first and the only kind of supported framework by Canonical for writing charms. It took us a little while, about 10 years. Um, but the nice thing is that's kind of as a result of learning how, where people struggle over time, the sorts of things that charms need to do, and kind of the tasteful way to interact with the Juju model as a charm engineer, right? So the operator framework provides quite a neat set of abstractions. It provides a very simple kind of methodology for subscribing to Juju events um, and essentially assigning callbacks to those so that you can handle install events, config events, relation events, that kind of thing. Um, in 2021, we had another go at our Kubernetes support and we introduced a thing called sidecar charms. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second, but essentially, if you see the term sidecar charms, that's referring to kind of the next generation Kubernetes charms. Um, and there's a bunch of canonical charm engineers in here who will be kind of using this every single day. As we go forward engineering charms, this is how we're building them. So some things haven't really changed. Um, just a really brief, like slightly more nerdy overview from, from the talk earlier on. Um, Fundamentally, um, the Juju controller uh, sits somewhere in your cloud on a machine in a container, and it emits a stream of events to the various applications that you deploy, right? And so each of the, ap an application is comprised of many units. So you might have a Postgres application, which is comprised of one unit or three units. And each of those units has an agent inside it, which is essentially listening to that event stream, right? So the controller will say, it's time to install now. And the agent essentially will wake the charm up and say, hey, it's time to install now, and, and essentially call a hook. Um, each unit has in it an agent, some code. In this case, I've called it charmed operator code and shown the Python logo for operator framework. Um, and then an application, right? Nginx, Postgres, HAProxy, whatever it is. Um, some of the events that are emitted from the controller are kind of on schedule or as part of a deployment process. A lot of them are kind of in response to CLI actions or dashboard actions from an administrator, right? Calling Juju relate this to that or Juju refresh or whatever it might be. So, Sidecar charms, um, when we moved on to Kubernetes, we kind of came across a, a couple of different issues, right? Kubernetes, as most of you probably know, is not the same as running on machines. We also wanted the ability for people to be able to use the same upstream OCI images they had been using for their deployments inside Juju, right? So inside a Juju deployment. So if you're already using the upstream MongoDB image or you're already using the upstream HAProxy image, you probably don't want to have to fundamentally re-engineer your container image just to be able to drive it with an operator. And that's kind of how Pebble was born. So Pebble is fundamentally just a little init system, a sort of very small API-driven init system. So if you're familiar with Supervisor D or Run It or even System D on a kind of macro scale, Pebble is like a really tiny one of those that's designed specifically to run in kind of small constrained environments. Um, it has an API which it listens to on a, like a Unix socket. 
And what we do with Pebble when we deploy something on Kubernetes is we take the upstream container image that you want to use, we create a new persistent volume and attach it and kind of inject Pebble into that volume, and then we override the entry point so actually your nice, clean upstream container that you didn't have to modify will just come up with Pebble and kind of wait to be told what to do. And then the operator framework has a whole bunch of tools in it that allow you to say to Pebble, hey, now go start MongoDB with this user with this environment variable, or start HA proxy you know, in this user and group with these environment variables. And it has a kind of layered configuration system that allows you to evolve what's running in your container over time. Um, Pebble's had quite a trajectory in the last couple of years. It's one of the kind of most actively developed parts of Juju, partially because, um, you know, Kubernetes is new and shiny to some extent, and a lot of the machine level support has been there for a long time in Juju, and so this has taken quite a lot of focus. It started out very, very simply, like it didn't have support for starting processes of different users, it didn't have support for this and that, and it's kind of grown over the last couple of years. So now it has a, a really nice files API, and what that means is that your charmed operator at runtime can say, okay, it's great that I've got this upstream image, but I really need a config file over there and kind of squirt that over using the files API. You can also, so you can sort of generically push and pull files out of containers at runtime. Um, there's a bit of a debate in the kind of some of the more Kubernetes focused folks in our company as to whether that's a good idea. You know, a lot of the Kubernetes kind of mantra is around um, kind of stateless applications and kind of immutable deployments. And you could argue that this is kind of violating that a little bit by allowing you to kind of push and pull files out of it. It's optional, it's there if you want it. If you're running big stateful applications like databases, that's quite a useful feature to be able to have. So this kind of gives you a bit of a choice there. If you do use Pebble, one of the nice things about Pebble is it allows you to run multiple services inside a container very trivially. Often people have had to install Tinny or SSX or Supervisor. Pebble is just there for you. So if you need to run MySQL and MySQL Router, or you need to run whatever it is, right, a couple of processes, you can do that and kind of layer the, layer the config up. When you look into the logs for Pebble, it's all nicely separated. It knows how to log individually for each individual process, and so you can kind of filter them out. Um, and we're also building into it this cycle the ability for it to speak to the Loki push API completely natively. So any application that's deployed on Juju on Kubernetes will natively be able to speak to a Loki instance for kind of log aggregation, which is part of our kind of broader observability story. Um, it has a kind of one-shot commands API. So this means that the charmed operator code, which fundamentally sits in a different container, is able to execute commands in the workload container. So say you've got your database process running, but there's kind of a one-shot command you need to do, you can do that in the background, and you can also do it from the CLI. So kind of really useful for troubleshooting, right? You can sit in the charm container alongside your charm code, invoke Pebble, and, and ask Pebble to run a command for you in the other end, and it supports kind of TTY forwarding and like input output streaming, the whole thing. Um, it's quite neat. There's a whole bunch of settings around how to handle, because it's an init system, it needs to know how to handle restarts. What happens if a process falls over? Do, I, do you want me to restart it? Do you want me to leave it alone? Um, do you want me to exit myself? So because we have Pebble as the entry point, if Pebble exits, it means the whole container kind of gets reaped by, by Kubernetes and, and recreated. So this is your get out, right? If you don't want to use the files API and you don't want to mutate things at runtime, you can just say to Pebble, like, okay, run, my, run the thing. If it falls over, just like exit and, and allow Kubernetes to do its kind of rescheduling trick. So it kind of gives you a bit of control, right? You can go either way. And finally, we have health checks. These behave pretty similarly to like Kubernetes health checks, right? So you can say, pull this HTTP API every three seconds, and if you get a 200, you're good. If you don't, something's wrong. You can also say, run this command, and it will run like a little bash command or a, a, some command inside the container, and it just checks for an exit code. So if you get exit code zero, you're good. If you don't, you're not. And it has a kind of raw like TCP mode as well. What we're going to build into that over time is the ability for those health checks to actually raise events inside the charm. So Pebble can continuously, every couple of seconds, be polling your service to say, like, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? And in the event that it's not okay, it can actually raise a, like a custom named event in your charm, like the you know, MongoDB is not okay event, and then you could decide what to do with MongoDB when it says it's not okay. So Pebble has kind of become a bit of a superpower for engineering charms on Kubernetes. And if I were a betting man, I would say it's probably going to end up in machine charms as well as we kind of iterate towards doing more universal charms, right? So where you can write your charm code once and you can deploy that exact same charm on Kubernetes or on bare metal because we can just stand up containers on bare metal hosts as well. Another thing that I'm super proud of and, and I think has really changed the game for the charming ecosystem and will continue to do so going forward is, is sharpening up our own internal practices around how we think about 
production on it in charms. So an interesting factoid is that Canonical really does dog food this stuff a lot. So all of our internal infrastructure, like large lumps of Launchpad, the Snap Store, our internal Matamo server, the Matamo server that some of you will have been on to chat with us, all of the discourse instances, all of the databases that back all of the discourse instances, they're all running on Juju in real life on OpenStack and various other clouds. Um, and because we've never had a canonical kind of branded, you know, vetted uh, setup for building charms, the approach to testing and validation, I think, was also kind of a bit scattered. So as we've built out the charm engineering organization over the last 18 months, we've also built a set of practices around how charms should be tested, how they should be validated. And we've got a whole set of like GitHub actions you can use where for example, on every single PR to your charm, you can actually go and get a real microcate inside GitHub Actions, bootstrap Juju into it, deploy your charm for real, and then make assertions about when the charm is active, what happens when you relate it to that charm, what happens if you unrelate it, what happens if you scale it. And so I think our internal charm teams are now setting quite a nice pace for the community about how you kind of sustainably add features to your charms and kind of keep control of them as they grow bigger. Um, so. The Charming Actions repository is, is public. It's got a whole bunch of tools in there for kind of making sure that your charm libraries are all up to date from Charm Hub. It can help you select the right re channel to release to on the store automatically. It can handle the kind of upload of the charm and the release of the various resources for you. Um, and if you look at any of the repositories on the canonical GitHub org, the end sort of dash operator, you'll see a pretty consistent approach there for how we do kind of unit testing, functional testing, integration testing, all inside GitHub Actions. Um, so pretty friendly. There's a kind of sample of a, I forget which one of these is, I think this might be traffic, um, but this is pretty kind of characteristic of how we are now introducing testing and kind of quality assurance into our charms. There is a style guide published on the, on the um, operator framework docs. So that style guide will walk you through kind of the sort of the ways that we configure formatters and linters and that kind of thing. And it's meant, meant that as we've grown the teams out, um, engineers are much more easily able to kind of work between projects and teams, right? If we've got a, you know, the, someone working on MySQL who needs to integrate with Grafana, it all feels very kind of um, familiar. And I'd like to grow that kind of across the community, not to the point where it's dogmatic, but at least have a, a strong kind of nudge for people who are getting started as to how they should structure their code, the sort of conventions that we follow, a bit of explanation as to why, and then how they can test that they're adhering to those things. So we're slowly kind of automating all of that and wrapping it up. So what have we been doing in the last six months? So firstly, Juju 3.0, the first major release in well, maybe three years. Um, it's been a long time coming. The, the previous kind of release didn't have Kubernetes support, so the sidecar charm support only landed in 2.9. Um, there's not a whole glut of new features in Juju 3.0, but what there has been is an enormous amount of blood, sweat, and toil from the team to kind of cut out a whole bunch of legacy code. I think we're something like 120,000 lines of code down on the last 2.9 release overall, and they've completely rebuilt their CI pipeline, so I'm looking forward to a whole series of kind of much better assured releases and hopefully enabling the team to move a bit faster as we iterate through the point releases of the 3.0 cycle. Um, there are a couple of things. So um, we've deprecated support for Windows Charms, um, partially because as far as I can tell, no one was actually using it and I didn't have a huge amount of confidence it was still working. Um, and it also will allow us to just be a little bit more agile and, and not have to worry about so many corner cases. We can drop support from Operator Framework and focus on what I think is our core value, which is operating software fundamentally on Linux at scale on any cloud. Um, and so we're gonna kind of slim down a little bit there. There's also a, a new um, user experience for actions. Some of you may have seen it. So there's a few command changes. If you're long-standing users of Juju, you'll notice a few changes that you'll need to kind of adapt to in your shell scripts and things. Um, but there's a, there will be a bigger write-up for that on Charm Hub in due course. This was a bit of a hobby horse of mine. Um, so I'm a fully paid up member of the Terraform fan club, but um, it's kind of at odds in many ways to how Juju has done its business. And I think it's important to realize where Juju can add value in this space. Um, and precisely what we're trying to achieve with the Terraform provider. So despite being a fully paid up member of the Terraform fan club, there are things that it is very good at and there are things that it is not good at. And the things that it is not good at, Juju is very good at. So I think this is gonna be quite a nice partnership. I'm doing a, um, a talk on this specifically tomorrow. So if you wanna see some use cases here um, and talk in a bit more detail about why we did it, then you can tomorrow. But fundamentally, you can think of the Terraform, the Terraform provider as another client to Juju. So you're able to use it to create models, configure charms, deploy charms, create 
relations. Um, they're kind of like a, a, it's a better way of wrapping up what you might know as a bundle, in my opinion. And as we evolve our notion of what bundles and stacks are, the Terraform provider will become the kind of primary way to do what you are currently doing with bundles. Um, so I think that's super exciting. It's also led us down a path of thinking a lot more carefully about how we expose an API for Juju. So uh, we've been in a kind of weird situation where we've been the only people consuming our own API for years. And as a result of that, we've made a few choices that I think have made it challenging for the rest of the community. Um, over the last six months, and, and especially over the next six months, there's going to be a bunch of effort on kind of untangling that and providing some much cleaner kind of well-documented client libraries for Juju. So the likes of Portana or whoever it is who might want to integrate Juju into their product to take advantage of the fact that it can drive really complicated applications can do so without having to just bundle the whole thing, you know, in one, one big binary. So one thing we did land, so probably the only like big standout feature in Juju 3.0 is secrets. So a kind of long demanded feature. Secrets are now a first class primitive in Juju, which means that if you're on OpenStack or you're on Azure or GCP or Kubernetes or whatever, you can just interact with Juju secrets and it will handle the back end however it needs. So by default, you get controller storage. That's what we've actually released in kind of GA for 3.0. So you can think about this a little bit like how Kubernetes secrets work. So you create a secret, it'll store a base64 version of that secret in the controller database. Um, your charms are able to get access to those secrets and also share them with other charms. So the days of kind of like creating database credentials and handing them over relations are hopefully gone. You can now, in your database charm, create a secret and then hand the handle of that secret over a relation to another charm. And when the other charm tries to access it, the Juju controller will say, yeah, you're good, you're allowed to see this, or no, sorry, you're not allowed to do this. And we, we support things like rotation and expiry. Um, so I think this is a really, really big kind of uplift for the ecosystem. There's a couple of other logos on the far right there. Um, so Kubernetes support is already implemented. It's behind a flag at the moment. But what this means is that you can have Juju use the Kubernetes secrets backend as its backend. So in your charm, if you create a Juju secret, um, Juju will track it, but actually the secret will exist on Kubernetes as a secret. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, if your application is particularly designed to run on Kubernetes and expects a particular secret in a particular place with a particular name that will kind of natively be available. But I think the most exciting thing here is if you're an enterprise who has got some kind of um, secrets driver hooked up to your Kubernetes cluster and you're using it to like pull all your secrets into an Azure key vault that's backed by an HSM or whatever, whatever else your cloud provider has sold you for secrets management, you'll just kind of natively get access to that, right? You create a secret in Juju and then all of that kind of encryption at rest and rotation stuff on the back end will get taken care of for you. Um, we're also going to support HashiCorp Vault. So this is the kind of like if you want to deploy proper big boy key management on on premise in your own cloud. Um, HashiCorp Vault is kind of what we're going to back. Uh, and that means that you'll be able to essentially do things like dynamic secret provisioning over time. And you know, wherever, whichever cloud you're on, OpenStack, GCP, Azure, you'll just be able to use the same secrets backend. Um, and it'll just work seamlessly, right? The charm won't have to care. The charm will just use the kind of create secret, rotate secret type tools that it would use normally. But fundamentally, Juju will hand off to the right backend. So what's next? So firstly, I think this is probably one of the most exciting ones to me, is we are going to um, stop relying on MongoDB for the controller database. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a choice that was made a bunch of years ago. It made sense. It served us well. But it's a little bit like dragging a big land anchor around, right? We are fundamentally a big, complicated, eventually consistent distributed system that other people use to build big, complicated distributed systems. And we were basing all of that on someone else's big, complicated distributed system, right? And so as Group Juju has grown and as we see the scale of various controllers growing, it's, it's I think, causing us some problems. And I would also like to get to kind of dissolve this illusion that Juju is this enormous, heavy, kind of black box piece of, piece of tech. And I think if we can get to using something like DQ Lite, you can, get, you can sort of imagine a future where like, you can dot slash Juju D on any machine and you instantly, like in a matter of one or two seconds, have a controller running on the machine with everything that it needs, right? Um, it'll lead to things like much quicker bootstrap times because we're not waking, waiting for Mongo to stand itself up and build a replica set and all those things. So I think this will be a huge win. It's also going to be a huge amount of work. Um, so my expectation is that this would be, you know, at the point where we complete this, it would be a Juju 4.0 because it's a fundamental shift in how Juju will be operating. Um, so I think this is really exciting. I would love to get to a point where Juju feels like this kind of small, 
like Swiss Army knife type tool that you can put down on your laptop in a cloud in a Kubernetes cluster and use to do all of the great kind of lifecycle management that you do today without feeling like you're you know, dragging around this enormous piece of tech that is very difficult to reason about. This is also another super exciting piece of technology. So we're looking at building, uh, so bear with me here, we're looking at building a scripting interpreter into the Juju controller. So this will be a like, heavily security constrained interpreter for Starlark. Starlark is a Python-like scripting language that was actually part of the Bazel project or is part of the Bazel project. And we will use this for kind of enabling us to level up the amount of automation that we can do for essentially application lifecycle management. So you can think about your operator framework code is the code that you are going to write in Python for driving operations and various things inside a unit, a container or a VM. This will allow you to write Python-like code that drives Juju, right? So this will, ask, this will be able to say to Juju, OK, when you connect these two things together on interface, here's some, here's some rules for you. Or perhaps, you know, can we do schema validation, right? So when you relate two applications, Juju can introspect and say, okay, they might have the same interface name, but they're fundamentally speaking a different language. I'm just not going to try and create that relation rather than allow it to go through and wait for things to explode. So it essentially gives us a way to put sort of programmable checkpoints in at every step of the way and allow the sort of charm developers or bundle developers or whatever to kind of add a little bit more smarts to Juju itself about how to reason about their application from a kind of macro level. Um, one of the first things that this is going to enable us to do is enable charm authors who are writing charms for Kubernetes to hand over essentially a set of expectations for what, what the charm is expecting in Kubernetes, right? So if you have a bunch of config maps and roles and storage volumes and secrets that need to exist in Kubernetes, you will be, your charm will then be able to say like, yo, Juju, here's a bunch of Kubernetes stuff. Please make sure that that's present before you provision my pods and start doing things, right? And, it, and that mechanism will also allow Juju to then track those things and make sure that when your application is removed, they're cleaned up sort of behind it. So it's essentially going to add like another little Swiss Army knife into Juju at the controller level rather than at the unit level. Um, Probably the most exciting and long-awaited thing that that will unlock is stacks. So right now we have bundles. Bundles are a way of saying, you know, Juju deploy a bunch of stuff, right? So Kubeflow, which is 30-something microservices, Cos, which is seven or eight applications, and Magma, which is 30-something services. The big problem with bundles is once you deploy them, the whole notion of that bundle sort of dissolves, right? You Juju deploy Kubeflow, and then you get a model with 30 charms in it, and then you can't did you refresh Kubeflow, right? You have to go and prod each individual thing. If you, like, it's very difficult to manage the bundle once it's deployed because fundamentally controller side, there's no such thing as a bundle. That all gets undone with stacks. So when you Juju deploy Kubeflow in the future, you'll just see a blob in your model called Kubeflow. And inside that will be the 30 things that make up Kubeflow. Likewise for COS. And this is where scriptlets become really, really useful, right? Because then we can say things like, OK, imagine you've got charmed OpenStack deployed as a blob in your model, and you say, Juju refresh charmed OpenStack, the charm author can, can provide a little script in there that says, okay, whoa, stop, this, is, this isn't simple, right? Like, if I'm going to upgrade OpenStack, I need to scale that thing down first, then I need to create this relation here, there's a new version of this thing coming in which expects a new relation, right? So rather than all these manual upgrade steps which tell you how to scale things, move data around, scale them down, back up, et cetera, you can essentially automate that whole thing. So it essentially will allow us to get to the next level of essentially fully automated software, right? It also allows us to really simplify the CLI. So those three commands down there at the bottom, in real life today, that's about 30 commands, right? Because you deploy COS, and there's seven or eight things, and you deploy Kubeflow, and there's 30 things, and you have to go and link all the Prometheuses for all the Kubeflow things and all the Lokis for all the Kubeflow things. In the future, you just deploy COS, deploy Kubeflow, and say, hey, Kubeflow, there's your observability stack. Off you go. And because the stacks know about the different endpoints that are inside them, Juju will essentially just auto-populate all of that and make sure all the things are hooked up for you. So this isn't going to land in its entirety in the next six months. Again, this is a pretty foundational piece of work. But the scripting engine is going to hopefully begin to land in the next six months. And that's really the foundational building block for this work. Um, it also unlocks a whole bunch of different possibilities for how we think about relations and units. Um, we'll get to. This, these sort of unitless charms, if you will. So those of you that are into kind of configuration charms and integration charms, those you'll now essentially be able to achieve just using Starlark controller side, and you won't need to provision an underlying virtual machine or Kubernetes pod to do it. So um, I think this is going to be a, probably the most transformational thing in the Juju, Juju's history to date. It's something we've been talking about for a really long time, and I'm super pleased that we are actually going to start work on it in this cycle. 
And unfortunately, we're out of time. That was actually the end of my slides. Uh, if you have any other questions, then come and grab me after this, and I'll happily answer them.